We're going to move on with a look at what's making headlines around the world with Alison Sargent. Hi there. Hi, Kat. We're going to start off in Mexico, where the new American Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, has just arrived for a much-watched visit, uh, and uh, he has had a bit less than a warm welcome, we can say. That's right. And we have to remember that this visit comes just a day after the American government released new immigration guidelines that are a huge source, source of tension with Mexico. A Mexican paper La Jordana reports that that visit is taking place under very high security. Meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal reports that the American delegation received a chilly reception arriving to a defiant Mexican government. The immigration measure that has the Mexican government the most upset is that the U.S. government said they will send those who cross the border illegally back to Mexico to await proceedings, even if they aren't Mexican. Now, for Mexican officials, this is an attack on their sovereignty. And as the Mexican paper Milenio reports, Mexico's foreign minister has said that Mexico won't accept them and that they don't have to. And there's a, an editorial that you've picked up from The Washington Post uh, talking about some ways that the Mexican government might choose to fight back. Right, and first and foremost, that includes refusing to accept people. Um, the Post says that they could clog U.S. detention centers and immigration courts at a huge cost to the U.S. government. They also say Mexico could stop controlling its own borders, which would allow Central Americans to travel to the U.S. through the country. We have to remember Mexico sent home 140,000 people last year, all of whom could have ended up in the U.S. So this editorial from the Washington Post is essentially giving a warning to President Trump, saying that he seems to have a good idea of the power the U.S. wields over Mexico, but he doesn't fully understand the pain that Mexico could inflict on the U.S. And of course, all of those thousands of people who are potentially going to be left in limbo. Uh, we'll move on, though, to a big story in the British press today, uh, the case of a British jihadist who's died in a suicide attack in Iraq. Uh, that was on Monday. His name is Jamal al Harith. He was a former Guantanamo Bay detainee who was released way back in 2004. He then traveled to Syria 10 years later and is believed to have died in that suicide attack in Iraq on Monday. Um, you can see in The Independent that Theresa May is coming under criticism for lack of surveillance because he left the UK for Syria back when she was the Home Secretary. But um, the most controversial element in this story is actually that the British government paid former Guantanamo detainees compensation, mm -hmm. an estimated 20 million pounds in total to 17 British detainees. You can see some of them there. Four of them are believed to have then gone on to fight alongside jihadists in Syria. Um, they received this money in 2010, just as Theresa May became Home Secretary. And so the right-wing Telegraph is saying that the British government needs to prove that none of the compensation ultimately ended up going to fund terrorism. Um, meanwhile, The Guardian today, in its editorial, defends the payments that, was, that were made to the Guantanamo, former Guantanamo detainees. The paper says the settlement saved the government embarrassment from torturing its own citizens and points out that most Guantanamo detainees have returned to society. Such a controversial story, isn't it? We'll move on to Turkey, uh, where there's a, this small but rather symbolically significant ruling we've been talking about in our main news bulletin. Women uh, officers in the army are now going to be able to wear headscarves, Islamic headscarves, as part of their uniform. Right, and this is another controversial story. The government had already made it legal in 2016 for female police officers to wear headscarves. In 2013, they had lifted the ban on headscarves in universities, so the army had been the last institution in which it was not allowed. Um, you can read all about it today in the Hurriyet Daily News. The ban on headscarves has been debated for decades in Turkish society, and not everyone is happy about this change. Um, our colleague pulled out this article from Al Arab. It's a pan-Arab paper based in London. It's highly critical of the lifting of the ban. It says that by lifting the ban, the Turkish president is dealing a big blow to laicite, to religious, um, to secularism in Turkey. And it's hugely symbolic because the Turkish army is what defends that freedom in the country. And so this, uh, for this paper, it says that this is an example of Erdogan's government making the country even more Islamic. Right. Finally, we've got a rather lighter story. Uh, controversial for some, though, in its own way. Alison, I'm going to put this question to you. Okay. Do you like pineapple on your pizza? Now, I do, Kat, but the president of Iceland does not. Goodness me. And it turns out it is a controversial question. He told this to a high school class during a visit that he wants to ban pineapple pizza, and that sparked an international outcry. Goodness. Um, one Twitter user threatened to take him to The Hague, to the, to the court. Um, Icelandic media has dubbed this story Pineapple Pizzagate. Um, but the New York Times in this article notes that despite the public outcry, the president's approval ratings have remained quite high. He's weathering that storm. Good to hear. I'd be very interested to hear what the Hawaiian papers make of that, one of their main exports, of course. Thanks very much. Alison Sargent, who's been looking through the international papers for us.
We're going to take a short break now here on Live from Paris and we'll see you in a couple of minutes' time.